Can you get pregnant with one fallopian tube? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, so I'm a fertility doctor. And every single day I talk about fertility, I answer your questions, and we help you understand your body a little bit better. And one question I get asked all the time is, can you still get pregnant after you've had a fallopian tube removed? Now, the short answer is yes. So if you want to stop the video, the short answer is yes. But the long answer is it depends. And a lot of this goes back to the etiology about why your tube is blocked and what the tubes do and what the risks are in general if you're trying to get pregnant after you have one tube. So if we're going to start, I just want to say real quick, thanks for being here. This channel is growing and I love it. I would love it if you would subscribe so that we can get more people really great women's health information. When you think about the body, one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that your uterus is almost rooted with the cervix at the top of the vagina. So think about it as a plant coming out of a pot. Your fallopian tubes obviously are attached to the uterus and they are like arms and they move around all the time. And I use the terrible analogy that it's like that red thing or that blow up inflatable outside the mattress shop that is moving around. That is really what your fallopian tubes should be doing. They should move and just kind of float around inside your abdominal cavity or your peritoneal cavity, which is the inside of your abdomen. Now we know that when you ovulate, you are ovulating from one side or the other. It does not alternate in any type of pattern. It is totally random which egg from which ovary is going to respond. So you have ovulation occurs. Remember that the ovary is separate from the fallopian tube. So if you think about this, the ovary is going to release the egg into the peritoneal cavity, just your abdominal space. And the fallopian tube end has these fimbria, which is going to act almost like a vacuum. And the tube is attracted to some of the properties of the egg and is supposed to swing over to where it is and help whoop, scoop it up into the tube. Interesting, the fallopian tube does a lot more than just serve as a highway or a transport mechanism. The fallopian tube, it's muscular, it has muscles, it has little cilia on the epithelial cells inside, and it both helps move and contract and move that egg along the way. And the sperm has to come into the fallopian tube because fertilization does not occur in the uterus. It occurs in the fallopian tube. And that egg must be fertilized within 24 hours of ovulation. Also, that fallopian tube is the environment of which early embryo development. So that embryo is not reaching that uterine cavity till day five or six of life. So these very early days where that embryo is going from one cell to two to four to eight to 16 in this rapid growth pattern, that environment of the tube actually determines a lot. So it's not just, oh, is it blocked and something gets stuck? The tube has a job. And so none of the tests that we have to evaluate your fallopian tube is going to tell us the functionality. So if we can think about the tests that we have to look at your fallopian tube, it all is looking at patency or is the tube open? So what that means is that I can do surgery and I can put a catheter in your uterus and push blue dye and I can watch that dye come out the end of your fallopian tube and that's called chromotubation. I can do an HSG, which is an X-ray dye test where I'm putting the dye into the uterus and that dye is coming out the end of the fallopian tube and filling up the uterine cavity and I can see that with x-ray. Or I can do a saline sonogram with a bubble test called the FemView where I'm watching with transvaginal ultrasound and I have water or saline inside the uterus and then I push little air bubbles through and those air bubbles are going to come out the fallopian tubes. None of these tests are telling me, does the tube work? Meaning, does it contract right? Can it transport the egg right? Is it the right environment to support that early embryo growth? And we know this early embryo growth time is so important because it took us years and years and years to find the right culture medium to grow embryos in the lab all the way to that day five to six space. So this growth period of the early embryo, it's highly sensitive. So these tests are telling us, is the tube open? Is the tube blocked? Is the tube blocked and dilated or called a hydrosalpinx? Now, one thing we know is that if you have a blocked and dilated tube called a hydrosalpinx, 
this is going to decrease your chance of pregnancy. So even if the other side looks beautiful and open, the presence of a single hydrocell pink that is connected to the uterus. So let's imagine, I don't know why my arm is the fallopian tube, but it is. So let's imagine the end of the tube is blocked. Hydrocell pink means water on the tube. So this is now very dilated and has this water that is sitting there. And really it's caused from secretions, mucus, it's kind of yicky stuff. And normally this would just move out the end of the tube, but because it's blocked, it can't. And this stuff is going to leak into the uterus. And then it's going to make the inside of the uterine cavity more toxic. So we see a decreased rate, even with IVF, even if I don't need your tubes to transport the egg and the sperm, but if I'm putting an embryo inside your body, I see a 50% decrease in the chance of you getting pregnant with an embryo transfer if I have a hydrocell pink that is connected to the uterus. This means the recommendation is that if you have a dilated fallopian tube, that it is removed before we go and we put embryos inside. And that has been well established. What about though, if you have that tube removed and the other tube looks great and you're trying to get pregnant naturally, or what if you've had an ectopic pregnancy and you had a tube removed? What if you had an ovarian cyst and it had torsion and it twisted around and you had it moved? Can you still get pregnant? So you, we know one, that you can, because the tubes are dynamic and often they can move around, they can still scoop up an egg. So we still see people getting pregnant after having one-sided tube removed. When you look at people who had an ectopic pregnancy and had a single tube removed, at a three-year follow-up, depending on the type of surgery they had, they had 56 to a 60% chance of getting pregnant by the three-year mark, which is not low, but also that is lower than we would anticipate we would see from people without tubal factor infertility. So that number in the general population would be closer to 90 to 95% over a three year period. So we definitely see reduced fecundability after you lose a fallopian tube. Now, fallopian tube disease is really prevalent. It causes about a third of the cases of infertility. And what can damage your fallopian tube? Well, it's typically inflammation. Something is causing an inflammatory response and inflammation leads to scar. I will use examples all the time, like you have a cut and you have a scab and it gets inflamed. And especially if you scratch it and irritate it, it will leave this deep, deep scar. The worse of the inflammation, the more you're gonna have scarring and the fallopian tubes are very sensitive inside. So what causes inflammation? Well, chlamydia and gonorrhea infection, pelvic inflammatory disease, which is where you have chlamydia or gonorrhea and it gets extremely severe really gets into your tubes or your ovaries, but even just a simple chlamydia test that you get treated for can cause later tubal disease. Smoking cigarettes causes inflammation inside our peritoneal cavity, and it has a higher rate of having tubal disease. Endometriosis, so we know endo is just terrible all the way around, but that inflammation from chronic endo can absolutely cause inflammation, damage your fallopian tubes. Abdominal surgery, so anytime you have abdominal surgery, if you had a ruptured appendix, if you had internal bleeding, that C-section you might have had, anything that could cause inflammation can lead to latter tubal damage. So certainly when I am counseling patients who have lost a fallopian tube, we are thinking about why did you lose it? What potentially could be going on because we don't always know the case. And do we think the other tube was exposed to the same thing? So for example, if you, had ovarian torsion. So your ovary and your fallopian tube got twisted around and they lost blood supply and you had them both removed. That might not impact the other tube in the same manner that stage four endometriosis or a chlamydia infection is going to do because that is going to not just selectively harm one. Now it might make one worse fast. So if you have endo, you might have one tube blocked and the other may not be yet, but it has been exposed to the same environment. And do we really think that it is going to function the same, even if it is open? And this is probably why even in the context of tubal patency, we see unexplained infertility. We see patients with stage three and four endo have such low fecundability rates naturally, even if their tubes are open. 
likely due to some of this inflammation present or damage to the functionality of the fallopian tube. So when I'm talking to patients and we're talking about after you've had a tube and it's been removed, what should you do? So this really depends on a lot of factors, how old you are, how many more kids you want, what do we think caused that tubal damage? Is it a hydrosalpings? Because if it's a hydro, it's got to go. And what is the risk of leaving the tube in place? Especially if we think about the ectopic pregnancy world. In general, an ectopic pregnancy is a tubal pregnancy, much more common in the presence of tubal inflammation or scarring. General rates of an ectopic pregnancy is about 2% of the population. However, after you've had an ectopic, your repeat incidence is then 15% after the first one, and after two, it is now 30%. So maybe you had an ectopic pregnancy and you had a tube removed and the other looks good, but you have a significantly higher chance of having a tubal ectopic pregnancy. And I always think this is especially risky in the patient who has something that caused inflammation, that history of chlamydia, pelvic inflammatory disease, the ruptured appendix, the endometriosis, because it makes sense that it could be applying to both sides at once. If we are older, if we are just getting started on our family journey, if the sperm is also not great, if we have low ovarian reserve, if we have known stage three or four endo, these are situations where potentially going on to IVF makes more sense to try to help you achieve your family goals in a faster, safer, and more effective timeline. But can you get pregnant with one tube? Yes, I have patients who do it all the time. I have patients who don't all do IVF, so there definitely are other options, but it's really a good discussion with your doctor about why we think this might have happened and your cumulative reproductive picture. 100% this is a time I advocate for testing everything. Are your tubes open? How does the uterus look? What's your ovarian reserve? How is the sperm? And a real honest discussion of your goals so you can make the best decision moving forward. All right, friends. Well, thanks for being here. You can ask questions in the comments and we'll get to them. And as always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or listen to the As A Woman podcast. Thanks, friends.